to come under the scrutiny. The more attempt is made to take him out of the purview of the bill, the entire effort will become more and more suspect. That's my view as a student of law. Now, the debate which is going on today on an attempt to eliminate corruption is a debate which is made, if I may say so, without proper appreciation of the ground realities. Now, what is corruption? Professor Rajkumar has attempted to define it, at the same time accepting the position that it is difficult, it is incapable of any precise definition. Corruption is an attitude of life. It's a particular mental frame, a perverted mental frame, and we are only thinking in terms of corruption in the official level. But corruption has a very strong presence in our social life. He has tried to sort of give, uh, give I mean, reference to various practices, like corrupt practices, fraudulent practices, coercive practices. If you analyze, I think learned judge Mittal is most welcome. Anyway, these are the three practices he has referred to. Now, if you if you make a sort of differentiation between the official level and the social level, which is the broad aspect, broad spectrum, I'll give you some concrete examples. When a girl child is forced into prostitution by her father. This is happening in our society. When a worker is not getting his due wages, instead of wages he is being assaulted. There is all kinds of deprivation which is happening in our society. You see, look at this very skewed social unjust social structure we are still having, despite our constitutional regime is about 60 years old. So every stage there is an element of corruption. Every case of deprivation, every case of helplessness is as a result of a corrupt act on the, on the part of somebody else. And this voiceless people, they cannot, they can hardly come for a redress. The, the, the legal framework which is there under our laws, do not touch them. Because most of these, these people who are victims, they, they, in, a corrupt, in, in any corrupt situation there are two, two players, the victim and the perpetrator. Most of the cases the perpetrator has no voice and judiciary has not been able to reach there. It's very difficult. The, 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 the talk of judiciary, the access, ju access jurisprudence, we have not been able to open the doors of court to those deprived section of our society. So corruption is very deep-rooted. And the other very disturbing feature is, <clears throat> in our society, a corrupt man is, unfortunately, often a successful man. And an honest man is a frustrated man. Chil Pinuri visits him in his old age. So this position, let us accept this as a position. Resistance, social resistance against corruption has not yet been built up. A corrupt man is not a social outcast. He is most of the time a, a hero, a leader. Therefore, who is to guard the guardian? That's a very vital question. Now the law, there is a law of called Prevention of Corruption Act. 
Now, to my mind, again I am not talking as a judge, it almost looks like preservation of corruption. You see, there is a very important provision in this act that unless there is a sanction, you can't proceed against the corrupt official. Who is going to give you the sanction? Because the corrupt people are very, very organized. They move in an orchestrated fashion. They, they, are not, they don't act in isolation. Who is to give you the, the sanction to prosecute? And without the sanction, the corrupt man cannot be prosecuted. Hundreds of cases where prosecution has been demanded, though the Supreme Court has said that this, this demand for prosecution should be a routine affair, they have been demanded. Those requests for prosecution are either sat upon or refused. The, the, the Act within itself can, has a mechanism for protecting the corrupt person. It is said that if this protection is not given, courts will be flooded or with, with uh, frivolous cases of corruption. But this is happening. This is our law. So we are not very sincere about eliminating corruption. Let us accept that. Unless we accept the ground realities, we can never eliminate corruption. And look at the, look at the effect of corruption. Today, development is, a, is considered to be a human right. Right to development is considered to be a very basic human right. Now, how can you develop? Because corruption means what? An undue advantage taken. What is due to me is denied to me. So, here, uh, Professor Rajkumar has quoted Justice Krishna Iyer, for whom I have the highest of respect, if I may just read out for what Professor Rajkumar has quoted. I must say he has quoted a very brilliant passage from Justice Ayer. He has said this, and I think this is relevant in this context to our discussion. The glory and greatness of Bharat, notwithstanding, we do not, even after the braggartly semi Sentinel noises behave as lawless brute, tribal and casteous, meek and submissive, when political goons and mafia ga gangs commit crimes in cold blood. And canny corruption and economic offences are re ruling the roost. The criminal culture among the higher ranks and creamy layers of society, even when nakedly exposed, does not produce the public outrage one should expect. With no burst of rage from those who must speak, in this darkening national milieu, the penal laws and its merciless enforcement need strong emphasis. Alas, the criminals are on the trial. The police suffer from dependencia syndrome and integrity is on the decadence. And the judges themselves are activists in acquittals of antisocial felons. Less than 10% of crimes finally end in conviction, and societal demoralization is inevitable. <coughs> Nobody can dispute the correctness of this observation by our great judge. Even now, at the age, I think, Justice Nair has crossed 95. Even now, you, you, you hear his voice decrying various acts of corruption at the highest level. So this <coughs> attempt made by Mr. Raj Kumar is a very timely attempt for rethinking of the entire situation. And look at the constitutional, I mean, fundamentals. <coughs> Our constitution, apart from the values which it has projected, there is a recurrent theme in our constitution, which you often lose sight of. The theme is on constitutional governance. 
those who are aware with Article 37 of the Constitution, where the, where the, the, the framers have said that these articles, namely the directive principles, may not be enforceable in court, but they are fundamental in the governance of the state. Then again, the chapter on fundamental duties. So these, by, by, by repeatedly referring to these provisions, Constitution has emphasized that if you want to make the constitutional promise a reality, this country must proceed on the basis of constitutional governance, which is repeatedly emphasized. It is not only your, your right, you have also have a duty. Therefore, I have a feeling that every act of corruption is unconstitutional per se. Whenever somebody is acting in a corrupt way, he is defying and defiling our constitution. He is committing a sin against the constitutional I mean, values. Therefore, these are to be tackled very seriously. But who is to do that? I am very happy that Professor Rajkumar has also talked about corruption in the judiciary. He has referred to the two recent cases of impeachment. But I think next, in the next edition he may kindly correct that Justice Dinakaran is not of the Sikkim High Court, he is basically of Madras High Court. Both the learned judges, unfortunately or fortunately, are, are my ex-colleagues. I have always, but I can't, uh, I can't defend them. I feel sorry for them. You see, if judges of the High Court today, things which are coming up in the newspaper, are accused of these kind of things, I mean, what will happen to elimination of corruption? But even then, I, I appreciate the candor and the courage with which Professor Rajkumar has attempted this book is a very valiant effort. Let us all who are present here congratulate him on this very valiant effort. And we are very happy that the hope he has expressed for elimination of corruption may one day come true. Thank you very much for calling me. Justice Ganguly, Mr. Naveen Jindal, Professor Rajkumar, Shri Manzar Khan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The publication of this book is timely and touches a matter of public interest. It brings into focus the inseparable bond of two critical requirements for human well-being, namely equality and dignity. This is eloquently noted by Justice Krishna Iyer in his foreword. Professor Rajkumar outlines a comprehensive legal approach to fight corruption. He looks at the human rights implications of corruption and articulates a rights-based approach to fighting it. The case is well made that corruption is not merely a law enforcement issue that can be addressed through better laws or more stringent enforcement, but a phenomena that violates the constitutional foundation of our democracy on the basis of which a rule of law society was meant to be established. The book emphasizes transparency in governance and ensuring accountability of the government as the key weapons to empowering citizens to address corruption. The comparative references in the book are exhaustive and give insight into the various models of combating corruption, especially in the Asian context. The postscript addresses the contemporary debate regarding the Lokpal and the author has given his views on some of the contentious issues. 
Friends, corruption, whichever way it is defined, is essentially a governance issue. Every society in history has pronounced norms of governance to distinguish between a good and a bad ruler, a happy and an unhappy people. The only meaningful corrective to bad governance is good and responsive governance. The Constitution of India prescribes justice and equality of status and opportunity to all people along with the ideals of liberty and fraternity. It lays down an institutional framework for achieving these objectives. At the same time, Dr. Ambedkar had administered a note of caution. His words remain relevant and I quote, the working of the constitution does not depend wholly uh, upon the nature of the constitution. The constitution can provide only the organs of the state such as the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. The factors on which the working of these organs of the state depends are the people and the political parties they will set up as their instruments to carry out their wishes and their politics. Who can say how the people of India and their parties will behave? End of quote. The starting point of discussion, therefore, should be the efficacy with which the people of India and their political formations have operated the institutions. The successes and limitations have to be shared in equal measure. At the same time, any study of governance in practice cannot avoid the changes in citizen awareness emanating from experience and a deepening of their understanding of norms. This provides the backdrop to many of our current debates. Three questions come to mind. One, is the basic problem of countering corruption a lack of good legal framework or an understanding of the human rights implications of corruption? Secondly, at a time when the phenomena of corruption looms large on our public and personal arenas, what is the importance of politics and the political processes in addressing this malaise? And thirdly, what role do we assign to ethical conduct in public life and upholding of political values? It is undeniable that public perceptions have evolved and today our awareness of and demand for better governance is quantitatively and qualitatively greater. So is the awareness that deficit impinges on human rights guaranteed to citizens 